When I grew up, I read 1984. And it was like, in one way, he was a visionary. But in other ways, he was very optimistic because he couldn't foresee the technological developments we are having. So from a technology perspective, it's much worse already. And that leads to a society which is a total surveillance state. 1984. I was born in 1984. Yep, that's me right there. It was the year that Orwell had envisioned as the beginning of the end of our privacy. Now we can see you. A world in which Big Brother was constantly watching. But no one paid that too much mind. After all, it was the same year Happy Families were bringing the first Macintosh computer into their homes. Hello, I am Macintosh. A decade later, my generation would already be firmly planted in front of a screen. We installed the internet on our computer just a short time ago, and I haven't been able to get the kids off it ever since. Little by little, we became addicted to it. So I guess this is a story of how it changed our lives. It started with games, chats, email, even movies. Our tastes develop right alongside the internet. My first love, my second love, my third. ICQ, then Facebook, Google, Twitter. By the time I was all grown up, I'd spent so much time online, it never occurred to me that there could be another side of it to explore, the so-called deep web. In fact, I had no idea how to find it in the first place. So I started out like anyone would, with a Google search. What lurks beneath the surface of the internet? The deep web. What is it exactly? Well, it's, a, it's kind of a vague term because it's comprised of anything that's just not indexed by search engines. All right, unindexed. So Google wouldn't take me very far. If we want to compare the size, then one great analogy is that the surface internet, the stuff that's indexed by Google, that would be sort of like the tip of an iceberg. The tip of the iceberg. The majority of users can only access 1% of all the information the World Wide Web has to offer. The rest, deep beneath the surface, is known as the deep web. So the deep web is like an inaccessible data dump, filled by banks, governments, corporations. And then there's the invisible corner of it. There's the regular internet, and then there's something called the dark net, an underground system of anonymous websites that are untraceable. What is the dark net? אנחנו בעצם במשך הרבה מאוד שנים נמצאים במצב שכל מי שרוצה לעשות משהו בהסתר, לקנות סמים, לקנות סחורה גנובה. היה לו בעצם מאוד קשה היה לבצע את זה בעולם האמיתי. כי בעולם האמיתי אתה צריך לפגוש את המוכר, ואז אתה גם צריך לשלם לו באיזושהי צורה כסף. כשאנחנו מדברים היום על, על הדארקנט, בעצם אנחנו מדברים על זירת מסחר חדשה. שוק חדש, שבו פחות או יותר הזהות של הקונה, של המוכר, וגם הכסף, בעצם מוסתרים, נקרא לזה מהרשויות, או מכל מי שרוצה לנטר היום פשע, או לא, או כל דבר אחר. You can find ways to launder money, hire a hitman, get guns. The deep web is used by many to buy fake identities. Websites offer green cards, driver's licenses, and passports. Some use it for more sinister reasons, such as human trafficking or drug exportation. Okay, אתה רואה? זו עוד מערכת הפעלה של האקרים. לא Windows, לא שום דבר בסגנון הזה. כן. מערכת הפעלה שהיא נבנתה מראש בשביל צרכים של האקינג. אוקיי? תל אביב זה hub for cyber security types. So it wasn't hard to find the Nor Cohen, a white hat hacker who dabbled in the gray zones of the internet for the good guys. The first thing the Nor showed me is how vulnerable and exposed anyone using the open net is. Oh, ראית? הנה הסיסמה של הרשת. מדהים, אה? עכשיו תחשוב שכל הסודות שלך... כל הסיסמאות בנק, הג'ימל שלך, הפייסבוק שלך, השיחות הפרטיות שלך, הכל נחשף עם הקשת מילה קטנה ואנטר. Circling the block, the nor could enter into practically anyone's computer within a hundred meter range. And just as a hacker could intercept my information on the open net, so too the police could use similar tools to monitor crime. תראה, אם אנחנו עכשיו נתקשר על גבי הרשת הרגילה ונתאם עסקת סמים, יש מכשירים שמנטרים אוטומטית את הרשת הזאת. אין בעיה של כוח אדם, לבוא להזמין אותך לחקירה מהירה. בדרקנט אין שום דבר שיכול לעצור בן אדם. עם מספיק זמן מלעשות כמעט הכל. אני רוצה שזה יהיה מאוד ברור מה זה דארקנט. אתה בעצם 
מתקין לעצמך סוג של תוכנה ש... שמסתירה בעצם את הפעילות שלך. Well, you're going to need some software. One of the most popular is called Tor. 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 Which originally stood for the Onion Router. The Onion Router. Onion Router. It was made by the U.S. Navy. How does Tor do it? Well, it takes your data and it bounces it around the world over several different data nodes. That way, no person or agency can figure out where the data came from or where the data is going. If you want to keep yourself invisible online, there is absolutely nothing better than Tor. It seemed unbelievable, under cover of complete anonymity, sitting in the living room between episodes of your favorite show on Netflix. Anyone could be pulling off the perfect crime. With no one the wiser. It took seconds to download and Tor was on my desktop. The door to the dark net was wide open. Goodness, this is quite extraordinary. It's such a large rabbit hole. I'll just take a look inside. The question was, where to? <gasps> my first stop was the hidden wiki. It didn't look so different than a normal Wikipedia page. Only the content was a little more, well, I don't know. See for yourselves. Drugs, lots of drugs. Weed, cocaine, heroin, crystal meth. When anonymity is <laughs> very difficult to achieve, and it's very special to achieve, Tor is the most close to achieve, and it's a lot. If I had to do something that's not legal, I would do it like Tor. And the list goes on. Killers for hire, offers to take out politicians. 65,000 to take out a journalist. What, that's all I'm worth? Aschalim nifratzim. En shum dabar shortzer utcha. En chok, en seder, en mishpat, en klum. Lachen ani roi b'tor dabar meod misukan. Meod misukan. Drugs and guns were just the shallow end of the dark net pool, though. There were plenty of groups and community forums to satisfy humanity's darker desires. Neo-Nazis, obviously they'd carved out their own niche. Then there were the guys into animal torture. Snuffed kids. Pedophilia. The most bizarre place I stumbled upon, though? That would be the Cannibal Cafe. Serving humanity. I mean, seriously? <laughs> שתלשו שערות אחת אחת. אין לנו מה לעשות מול הדבר הזה. זה פשוט סיוט. A modern day virtual Sodom and Gomorrah. It sure looked like a nightmare. If the rules of the game were changing, then what were the police doing to catch up? And did they even stand a chance? אוקיי. Okay. רצים? כן. <coughs> אפשר? כן. Okay. מעניין אותי לדעת איך, אם בכלל, הדארקנט שינה את מפת הפשע, מפת הפשיעה. הפשע שינה את פניו. היום אתה רואה יותר ויותר שהפשע עובר מהעולם הפיזי לעולם המקוון. ולמה? ולו בגלל הסיבה הפשוטה שבעולם המקוון אנשים נוטים לחשוב שהם יכולים להיות יותר אנונימיים ולעשות עבירות בלי להתאפס. תיכנס לתוך הדארקנט, אני מניח שנכנסת, אתה רואה לצורך העניין בן אדם רוצה לרכוש X, Y או Z, לרוב... הדברים שהוא ירצה לרכוש זה דברים שאסור לו להחזיק ואסור למוכר למכור. אם זה סמים, אם זה נשק, אם זה אה, תועבה של קטינים, אם זה לקנות שירות. החל מהדבקה של מחשב, רנטה האקר, אה, וכלה ברצח. The list of cyber threats went on and on, but I kept wondering. Is hiding your identity online a crime in and of itself? העניין הזה של אנונימיות. האם אתם רואים בזה דבר רע, דבר חיובי, או אתם אדישים לזה? תראה, התפקיד שלנו זה לאכוף את החוק. מי שקובע את הנורמות החברתיות במדינת ישראל זה המחוקק. אני לא חושב שזה המקום שלי להביע דעה אם אדם צריך להיות אנונימי או לא. אני כן יכול לומר שהאנונימיות היא לכאורה נותנת לאדם לחשוב שאם הוא יעשה עבירה הוא לא ייתפס, וזה טעות, זה לא נכון. So was assuming that we could hide anything at all online just wishful thinking then? Could the police really find anyone and everyone hiding in the dark net? It took a considerable amount of digging and awkward questions before I found someone from the digital underworld who was willing to meet in person. Where could we meet in real life though? Maybe I'd seen too many movies, but somehow an abandoned warehouse seemed appropriate. 
אני מאוד נורמטיבית, נכון? ואני מאוד כבר מבוגרת, וכבר יכולה להיות בגיל של סבתא, נכון? עכשיו, זה שזה אפל, וכל מה שאומרים, פורנוגרפיה, וסמים, בסך הכול זאת מדיה, זאת אומרת, זה שוק כמו כל שוק, שוק שחור אמנם. אבל זה בסך הכול אמצעי. זאת אומרת, אני רואה שזה דבר חיובי מאוד, אם אתה נאמן לעקרונות שלך. אותי לא תמצא משוטטת לא בפורנוגרפיה ולא ב... לא בהימורים, כי הם לא מעניינים. אבל אולי ברוצחים שכירים, כן. <laughs> מאוד כעסתי על זה שלא יכולתי לקנות איפה שרציתי, מוצר שרציתי. בדקתי באינטרנט, אמרו לי דפדפן תור מתאים. נכנסתי. אכן ראיתי, והעולם מרתק. זו דווקא שמכינים ממנה חשיש ביתי. יש הרבה שעושים את זה. קוקאין? קוקאין, אז זה גם. אז תשמע, הרופאים נותנים ריטלין, בשביל מה צריך קוקאין לא חוקי? על זה אתה כועס? אין מה לכעוס על זה. זו הפלטפורמה. הם מציגים את מרקולתם. Of course, Lily was hardly who I had imagined I'd be meeting with. She looked more like one of my mom's friends than someone who used the dark net. אבל באמת, זה לא מפחיד אותך. לא, זה לא מפחיד, מפחיד שוב, מה שעושים עם זה. אפשר לעשות עם זה דברים רעים, זה נכון. אבל הדארק נט כשלעצמו לא מפחיד. I tend to be skeptical of people who tell me there's nothing to fear. Was the dark net really just a black market equivalent of eBay? Technology has always been two-sided. Depends how you use it. Take, for instance, the 3D printer. Rui Cezana had used one to print a 3D gun, whose model he downloaded from the dark net, and snuck it into a campus rally with one of Israel's biggest politicians. The funny thing about it, he said, Everyone just stood around and watched. ההתפתחות הדרמטית העיקרית היא זו של ייצור מהיר וייצור אישי, מה שנקרא באנגלית Rapid Manufacturing. אם בעבר היינו מייצרים רק במפעלי ענק עם מכונות שהיו שוות מיליוני דולרים, הרי שהיום בעצם כל בן אדם יכול להחזיק מכשירים כאלו בבית שלו. מדפסת התמימת שאפשר להדפיס באמצעותה אקדח, יש את זה לאנשים בבית. אבל לא כל בן אדם יכול להדפיס אקדח ככה סתם. הוא צריך להוריד את התרשים מאיפשהו. ומאיפה המידע הזה מגיע? מהדארקנט. כל בן אדם שמוריד את האקדח יכול להסתכל עליו באופן וירטואלי במסך, יכול להחליט להעביר את הפין לפה, את המצרה לכאן, וליצור אקדח שקצת משופר. This is called the lower receiver. This doesn't have a serial number, and it doesn't require a background check. ואם הוא מגלה שהוא באמת עשה אקדח יותר טוב, מה הוא יעשה עכשיו? הוא יעלה אותו בחזרה לרשת. This is a ghost gun. מה שאנחנו רואים זו מגמה של דסקילינג, הפחתה במיומנות הנדרשת להשגת מטרה מסוימת. אתה רוצה לסנטז אצלך בבית חומרים כימיים שונים? אתה יכול להוריד את התרשים שמסביר למדפסת איזה חומרים לערבב ביחד כדי להביא לתגובה כימית וליצור מורפי, או ואליום, או מריחואנה, או אבק שרפה, או ציאניד. מתקן יעשה את זה בעצמו בבית. אבל אני רוצה לקחת אותך לכיוון השני. חברות תרופות. מוציאות תרופות בעלות אסטרונומית, וחולים לא יכולים להרשות אותן לעצמם. אנשים שיש להם את היכולת, למשל, להעביר תרשימים של, של יצירת תרופות בבית, יתחילו לעשות את זה בעשור או שניים הקרובים. יקרה בדיוק מה שקרה עם האקדח המודפס. הם יתחילו לשפר תהליכים. כל בן אדם... השתתף במהפכה הגדולה הזאת של החלפת המידע, זיווג של רעיונות חדשים. הדארקנט יכולה להיות המקום שבו כל רעיון ישן יתערבב אחד עם השני, כמו שאמר מאט רידלי, בעצם הרעיונות יעשו סקס אחד עם השני, וילדו רעיונות חדשים ומופלאים. ההירתמות הזאת לא מתרחשת ב... באוטוסטרדת המידע הרגילה, מכיוון שמאבקים הגדולים באמת תמיד דורשים הרס יצירתי. וכאן אתה רואה בעצם את החשיבות של הדארקנט, שמאפשר את הנתיב להעביר מידע, והמידע הזה יכול לעורר מהפכה. 
Revolutions brewing in secret. Wasn't that exactly the type of thing that those in power generally wanted to prevent? The Darknet had already attracted the U.S. government's attention. The FBI has effectively smashed the hornet's nest, and we are in the process of rounding up and charging the hornets. And the Pentagon had brought on a team to catalog illegal activity there, including these two, Alejandro and Amanda. In a sense, be hackers for hire. Our job is to sort of get around a lot of the hard stuff, on the dark web and sort of bring it to light. So we could find uh, the pedophiles, we can find the people hitmen that are hitmen for hire, if, if all that kind thing, of stuff, yeah. communicating this stuff with the Tor project and communicating some of this stuff to law enforcement. So. Because the, the, you know, the creators of the Tor project don't, don't want to facilitate child exploitation, yeah, right? Let's be very clear that. about that. Do you think that, that some things deserve to stay in the dark or does everything need to be in the light? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, on some level, I think anonymity is extremely important. I, I think there's certain things that, um, I mean, there's bad people out there. there there's, <laughs> there's bad people that you want to, <laughs> that users bad... need anonymity from, and then there's bad people that are using the anonymity for the, for the wrong purposes. Um, I do think anonymity is important. I would not like to de-anonymize absolutely everything. But why? Why? Why is anonymity important? It's all about, you know... Uh, the principle well, of privacy. It's the principle anonymity. of privacy. And for what purpose? Why do we need it? The classic example that the Tor Project always um, kind of uses out there is oppressive regimes. Yeah, and it's, yeah. this isn't a theoretical argument. You can look back um, through history and um, whenever you have uh, revolutionary progress, you know, the, it always starts underground. I think about it and, you know, if, if, let's say in some, like, futuristic, apocalyptic scenario, my government turns on me and I want to be part of the rebellion <laughs> or something, like, you know, I would want something like this to exist. That was about the last thing I expected to hear from anyone employed by the U.S. government that even in the back of their minds was a Big Brother-like scenario, the kind of idea you'd sooner expect to hear from anarchists. Instead of privacy, we have permission. It's about control, isn't it? It's about the incremental eradication of freedom. This is That's Julia Turiansky, a self-proclaimed anti-state propagandist. Don't police me. Statism is death. Jesus. Join me in my love affair with freedom. Privacy, control, freedom. This is Anarchast. These were buzzwords for a small group advocating for a new alternative to a broken system. People get afraid of new things very easily. And these are new ideas. Hacker, anarchist, darknet, they sound foreign. These were the crypto anarchists, an offshoot of a small group of technophiles that came together at the dawn of the internet age. The cypherpunks. And what is a cypherpunk? What do you guys stand for? Cypherpunks are cryptography activists. We believe in personal privacy for everybody. It was the cypherpunks who had been responsible for the very first instance of a darknet, what they'd called the black net. Americans are not prepared to face the fact that they have, they're living in an electronic police state. If anyone could tell me what it was I was missing about the darknet, it had to be them. And they were all gathering at the Institute of Crypto Anarchy in downtown Prague. Police represents uh, tools and ways how to protect our freedoms against uh, authoritative tendencies in political and social institutions. I'm sorry, I'm sorry it's limited. Really, we cannot we cannot uh, take uh, pictures of the people. Yeah. Stepping into the hackers' congress, I had felt entirely unsure about what I was about to enter. So unsure, in fact, that I had circled the block before actually going in. And when I finally found a few participants who would speak on camera, it came with certain conditions. Great. Let's go inside. Thank you. So when you're all set, you can have a, you can have a seat. Thanks. So what's with the mask? What's with the get? Well, you know, I think uh, it's very important that uh, you, you keep your privacy today. And you have a lot of, you know, facial recognition outside. 
We're living in a time and age where automatic computer algorithms are searching all media for faces. And I don't really want my face to be everywhere I am. If you want to meet me, if you want to see me, come and meet me in person. So I'm not the media guy. So how do you refer to yourself? How do you identify yourself? Well, in this context, call me smuggler. And what does your mom call you? Dad, I won't tell you. Ask my mom. <laughs> The reason we want privacy, fundamentally, is it because it allows free human action according to our own will. Humans develop when they use their own mind and make their own choices, good or bad, and they deal with their own consequences. That's how we grow. You have to be f able to screw up without getting slammed. And when there's somebody looking down at you, when you have to be afraid, when you have to lower your voice to talk about certain things, you are squeezing out human development, human evolution. I think nowadays it's a much more subtle way of totalitarianism. On the outside, you have all these freedoms. You can wear whatever you want, you can do whatever you want, you can be gay, it's all, it's all fine. You know, like we are free people. Earlier, totalitarian systems, it was much clearer to people that, that you're not free. And now it's like you're, you're this happy consumer who can, you know, watch all the movies on Netflix, but um, as soon as you're really trying to push a little bit to change the system, you are being attacked. And all the other ones say, yeah, what's your problem? You know, just like me on Facebook. When we're sitting in front of the computer in our own homes, we're in the environment that we usually associate with privacy. But what we're actually doing is we're shouting things from the rooftops. Without protecting ourselves, we have just opened our private living space to the whole world. And that is why I say, be careful. What you're doing right there is something you wouldn't do if you would really understand what you're doing because you're not doing it in any other way of your life. I've never been particularly privacy-minded. When I open an app on my phone, I'm not exactly thinking about where that data might end up. Facebook, Google, they're surveillance systems. Anytime you use a product that's free, okay, somehow that company has to pay its employees. So that means you're not really the customer, you're not paying them and that means you're the product. I'm not gonna stop using Facebook, I'm not gonna stop using Google until they start hunting people down and killing them. The idea that my generation would suddenly stop using social media seemed a little crazy, which is more or less how my friends saw it too. I mean, it is fucked up that you can't just like say whatever you want. I guess I've accepted the fact that I'm being tracked. I'm not doing anything illegal. Not on the internet. If I have nothing to hide, why should I be afraid? I'm thinking if I have anything to hide. <laughs> your privacy is not violated in the moment that somebody takes your pictures and posts them online. Privacy is violated in the moment somebody is interested in your pictures and stores them. That is where the violation happens. Somebody grabbing your data and just storing it because he might want to use it. And it's this threat of a might that we are all subconsciously aware of. Everybody does something wrong. You know, maybe you cheat on your wife or you were drunk at this party and you have this, you know, ridiculous picture of you and, and then they can use that information to either, you know, like enforce a law which you didn't enforce before or they just, you know, blackmail you in public. When you're in a state where you have no privacy, where you have no anonymity, you're always worried about somebody looking in, somebody who's gonna either physically punish you or say bad things about you behind your back or shame you. Shame among humans is like the weapons of mass destruction. So what is it that we need to do to preserve our freedom? Start wearing masks? Throughout this 3D printed fashion show, I kept thinking about how paradoxical it is to believe we could only really be free in hiding. Especially in the West, where we're so used to exposing everything. 
I had been in Cairo during the Arab Spring, at the same time that Shira Frankel was writing about the dramatic events there. Hey, Shira. Now she was writing for BuzzFeed about encryption technologies, like Tor. In the West, we have this idea that the dark web is dark and evil and um, all things nefarious, where in the rest of the world, it's not called the dark net, and it's not thought of as this evil meeting ground. It's thought of as a place for them to exchange information in a free and safe way. I've met with um, LGBT activists in countries in Africa and in the Middle East who consider it their, one of their only remaining safe havens. And when I say to them that, you know, in the U.S. we call it the dark net, that's what our politicians call it, they laugh and they think that's an insane idea. And they go, but this is, this is where we're safe. This is where we talk. This is where, you know, as a, I can be myself in a safe way. So there are large parts of the world where just being yourself online is enough to get you arrested. So for those people who know that they aren't safe online, that they aren't safe to just send emails or be part of Facebook groups, um, encrypted technologies could mean sort of, can, can be a lifesaver, actually. I could understand the need for the dark net while living under a dictatorial regime, but freedom is a fundamental part of democratic societies, isn't it? אנחנו נמצאים היום במפגש בין שתי צורות שלטון מתחרות. זו שבה האח הגדול הוא זה שמנהל את החיים לתושבי המדינה, ומהצד השני, שלטון ההמונים. השלטון מנסה להבטיח את ביטחון האזרחים ואת הביטחון שלו עצמו. כדי לעשות את זה, הוא חייב לעצור את האיום שטומנים לו הזאבים, הטרוריסטים. האנשים שרוצים להפוך את השלטון בכוח, ולפעמים גם האנשים שרוצים להפוך את השלטון לא בכוח. השאלה היא, איך השלטון יכול לעצור את הטרוריסטים ואת הפושעים בלי לפגוע גם בחופש הדיבור? ולשאלה הזאת אין עדיין תשובה טובה. <אז> מה אתה עושה כשהחובה שלך היא להגן על המדינה? ואתה רואה שהאיום כל כך גדול, אתה נכנס להיסטריה ואתה מתחיל לעקוב אחרי כל דבר וכל אחד. כי אם אפילו טרוריסט אחד עובר בין החורים שב... שברשת שלך, אתה יודע שהאיום שהוא טומן הוא כל כך גדול, שאתה לא יכול להרשות לעצמך את זה. Oh, 19 the U.S. Congress would pass the Patriot Act, and the NSA would begin the mass surveillance programs it had sought to enact for years. I take the threat of terrorism seriously, uh, and I think we all do. It would be over a decade before Snowden revealed that the NSA hadn't just been tracking terrorists. They'd been following millions of innocent Americans as well. I think it's really disingenuous for the government to justify programs that have never been shown to keep us safe but cost us liberties and freedoms that we don't need to give up. When I came back to the U.S. and I spoke to people about the Snowden files, a lot of them sort of shrugged their shoulders and were like, well, what do you expect? Of course, the government's doing this. Of course, the government's monitoring us in these, you know, X, Y, and Z ways. Um, and so I thought that was interesting, that on the one hand, here were these files, this cache of documents that was going to reveal in an unprecedented way what the government was doing to spy on us, and at the same time, who were Americans shrugging their shoulders and being like, eh, so what? They say they want the information because it's good for you. Well, there's a problem with that. Number one is that they just collect everything they can and get everything they can because they can. And because, to be honest, if you're in government, if you're doing that type of work, the odds are very high that you have sort of a control bias psychologically. They like control. They want to think everything, if something, oh, something bad could happen if this, if we don't control that. Well, something bad could always happen. So when you take that as a standard, there's no end. In the NSA, we can see that the government and the NSA have already started to bring the NSA to them that they learn the students of them what are the damages, not of terrorists, of Muslim soldiers. When the government shows what are the damages of Muslim soldiers, he shows one of them and says, he is in porn on the internet. Suddenly, the government has a power, like this, to 
לכבות את המוניטין ואת הסמכותיות של כל, של כל בן אדם שהוא לא, שהוא לא אוהב את מה שהוא אומר. אולי אני רק אומר שיכול להיות שגם המטיפים החשובים ביותר, גם מרטי לותר קינג, שאגב פגד באשתו על ימין ועל שמאל, ועישן באופן סדרתי, דבר שהוא הסתיר מהציבור עוד כמה שהוא היה יכול, אם הוא היה חי היום, והוא היה מתחיל את אותה מהפכה של זכו... לתת זכויות לשחורים באמריקה, השלטון היה יכול לכבות אותו בכזאת קלות. ואם אפשר לעשות את זה לכל אחד, לאן זה לוקח את המדינה? כשהדעות הסותרות לא נשמעות. כשאין דמוקרטיה אמיתית שיכולה לגרום לשלטון לשנות כיוון ולפנות למקומות יותר בטוחים. זה מוביל אותנו למקומות רעים מאוד. The next step was how to build systems that exist outside of government control altogether. Crypto anarchists are anarchists who believe in using cryptography to create a free zone, a terra nova, a free territory with walls of cryptography around it. And they can converse with cryptography. They can use cryptographic currencies. They can create, to a very considerable extent, a separate realm in which they can live. How would this separate realm operate, though, if we're still completely dependent on the state? What the state provides is uh, lots of bureaucracy, senseless work that I have to do every day, like to go to offices and to undergo all these taxes and so. But states also provide basic needs we have, like the safety, security, roads and everything. But all of these things can be provided privately uh, by means of decentralized tools. So everything can be uh, provided by by global providers or, or, or provider from a totally different country. The, the, the national borders are not making sense in this, in this uh, surrounding because, you know, on deep web, it's, it totally doesn't matter where you join from. So then the alternative to the state and systems growing in the deep web was a call for revolution? With that thought in mind, I finally managed to catch up with Julia Turiansky, whose flashy YouTube clips had brought me to Prague. But you cry, prove anarchy works, and we say, welcome to anarchy, population everyone. Could it be that our anarchistic ideas sounded a little more grounded in person? You know, I, I, think, I think people need guidance, people need governance in some degree, but the difference is that governance doesn't have to be forced upon people. As long as you can opt out and leave, then that's morally, uh, it's morally in line with an anarchist philosophy. So yeah, I'm not naive. I, I, I don't think <laughs> I don't think there's going to be some grand collapse and we're going to have beautiful anarchy. I think it's about creating those little communities for yourself and finding locations where you are able to opt out, which are becoming more uh, diverse and more dispersed and more available. One of the systems that the crypto anarchist community was already using to opt out was Bitcoin. cryptocurrency that allows you to conduct anonymous transactions online and has already gained an international following. Once you've got virtual currency, it's not too far of a leap to start creating virtual states. Yesterday there was a lecture about uh, BitNation, which is a project that shows that the blockchain technology can be used for uh, services that are usually provided only by governments and states. BitNation is creating a new world where thousands or millions of nations actually compete for customers by offering better services. It's a world where everyone can choose. BitNation is a nation, which means connecting people who share familiar, similar values, etc., together uh, without a state, right? So I would call BitNation a stateless state. If you dissociate governance with territory, you don't need to fear for your own governance principles. Alongside the stateless state would come online crypto markets for everyday goods. Essentially the family-friendly version of what I'd already seen on the dark net. There will be decentralized, anonymous crypto markets 
uh, that will be technically impossible to shut down these markets by, by the government. Financial and social system will collapse. Yeah. There is no rational approach how uh, social, uh, social system can survive, um, yeah. especially if you have, if you have uh, uh, so many old people yeah. and only few young productive people. Uh, so I think the government social system will collapse. So this can be a good point to switch to something completely new. Government collapse, parallel systems to replace them. The crypto anarchists traced it all back to the cypherpunks and what they'd written in 1988. You look at the cypherpunks and the things they were writing before the technology was there and now the technology is here. I mean, how happy are they? Like, they were right. Reading their writings felt like reading some sort of sci-fi prophecy. Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Everything that they said would happen almost 30 years ago was actually happening in the here and now. Bitcoin, building anonymous systems with electronic money. WikiLeaks, crypto anarchy will allow national secrets to be traded freely. The Darknet, systems which allow anonymous transactions to take place. Crypto markets, an anonymous computerized market will allow illicit and stolen materials to be traded. They even predicted the way that governments would respond to these developments. The state will try to slow the spread of this technology, citing national security concerns. Whenever somebody does something that protects the privacy of an individual, sooner or later, the government and the government media will take out one of those cards and say, this is bad because terrorist, or this is bad because drugs. Those things are actually bad. You know, yeah, it is bad to be a terrorist, but what the government really does there, or the opponents of privacy really do there, they play on our emotional piano. Okay, let's see. WikiLeaks, U.S. government. The United States strongly condemns the illegal disclosure of classified information. It threatens our national security. If this becomes a standard currency, it could radically and dramatically transform the role of central banks. A few years ago, we learned of an underground website called Silk Road. I'll push for increased funding aimed at fighting cyber drug dealers. The Silk Road had been synonymous with the darknet. Until the U.S. government shut it down, it had been the largest market of its kind, moving $1.2 billion in product, mostly drugs. The biggest criminal trial in the history of the Internet is over this morning. The mastermind of the Silk Road website was sentenced to life in prison without parole. For the crypto anarchists I met in Prague, Ross Ulbricht wasn't some sort of drug kingpin. Instead, he was the most visible victim of the government's efforts to kill off the darknet crypto markets by making an example out of him. If you look at the history of cypherpunk crypto anarchy, that's actually one of the first real-world examples of a counter-economy in operation, and it was hugely successful. You had a darknet market, you had some form of anonymization, you had some form of uh, digital anonymous currency, and it become very big very quickly. And that's basically where the uh, explosive power of something like Silk Road lies, and I think why, that's why the state realized it is actually threatening. Silk Road was threatening the status quo. It was threatening the power of the state. Now imagine that would exist not just for drugs, but it would exist for food. It would exist for energy. If every good on the planet is reasonably priced available on the black market, the state loses most of his income, most of his ability to regulate, most of his ability to actually favor certain companies. And then what would happen? It would lose his power. I want governments to be away, if that's my option. If I had the red button that says, all governments, all states, all involuntary organizations disappear right now, I would hit the button right now. No states, no central governments or banks. What would happen if we pushed the red button? Absolute chaos? Or a new beginning? I left Prague feeling like I was coming back from the future. Only a rude awakening was waiting for me in the present.
Two attacks in Paris, one in the U.S. Oh my gosh! Downed plane in Egypt. Didn't we need stronger protections against these guys? Even if it meant sacrificing some privacy? You can't have 100% security and also then have 100% privacy and zero inconvenience. Uh, you know, they, they, we're, we're going to have to make some choices. I was just in Washington a couple months ago, and I was speaking to a lot of politicians, and this is just following the, um, the horrific attacks that happened in Paris and just before the attacks that happened in, in San Bernardino in California. And a lot of the politicians were saying, you know, the dark net's to blame, tours to blame, encrypted technologies are to blame. There had been that very week a lot of reports in the press about how um, the attackers in, that were involved in Paris had communicated with, with one another and with um, with ISIS leadership back in Iraq and Syria through TOR. The dark web. The U.S. believes ISIS and others are now using the most covert part of the online world to recruit fighters, share intelligence, and potentially plan real-world attacks. And in the weeks that emerged, it turned out that not only had they not used encrypted technology, they'd, they'd been sending SMS messages to one another. I think that for politicians, oftentimes, blaming things on the dark web is a really easy way to sort of wash their hands of an intelligence failure. Why say, we missed an SMS call? We missed, I mean, a SMS, SMS text message. Why say, we missed a phone call? When you can say, oh, no, no, this was on the dark web. We couldn't possibly have found this, this scary thing that was happening. Um, it's a carte blanche to say, we didn't miss anything. It's easy to scapegoat the darknet. To say that if it weren't there, our lives would be safer, more secure. But the darknet has always existed, in one form or another. Tira, I'll tell you how I met the darknet the first time. I was four years old, and my parents, every time they didn't want to understand something, they went to the darknet, in Yiddish. Yiddish was the darknet of them. And at age four, I lived in a room in two rooms. In the room of the door, in English, and in the Yiddish, where I collected the feelings, קולט את המבטים, קולט את הרוגז או את מה שזה לא יהיה, אבל עבורי זה, זה, זה מוצפן. So then the darknet isn't just a place. It's the representation of a basic need we all have. Get ready to amazing revolutions in what is to be human. For Yanki Margalit, an evangelist for the movement Integrate Humans and Technology, we are going to program mankind. Our very way of thinking needed a reset. הדארקנט עבורי הוא מקום מאוד מאוד מעניין. מי שמתחזק את הדארקנט, מי שבונה את הדארקנט, האידיאליסטים שמחזיקים את הדארקנט, הם אנשים שהם מאמינים מאוד מאוד בכל ליבם, בזכות לפרטיות, באפשרות לפרטיות. אני רק יודע שהמאבק שה- שלנו היום לפרטיות הישנה הוא פתטי. הוא פתטי, כי מזמן הפסדנו אותו, צריך להגדיר את זה מחדש לגמרי. כשאתה מסתכל על... על, על השנים האחרונות, ואתה מסתכל טיפה גם לתוך העתיד, אתה רואה שהמין האנושי כולו משתנה. הוא עובר היום איזשהו סוג של שינוי מאוד מאוד מואץ. אנחנו מחברים את הטכנולוגיה לביולוגיה, את הביולוגיה לאלקטרוניקה, ויוצרים לדעתי מין אנושי חדש. מין שהוא אה, משוכלל יותר, מחובר יותר. אה, אנחנו גם לוקחים את האנשים כאינדיבידואלים. ומחברים אותם למשהו גדול יותר. עבורי זה מזכיר מאוד את, ה... את ההתחברות של התאים שיצרו את הבן אדם. הרי תחשוב על התאים שבונים אותך. טריליונים של תאים שבונים אותך, התאים האלה איבדו את הפרטיות שלהם, התאים האלה איבדו את האינדיבידואליות שלהם, אבל נוצר בן אדם בסופו של דבר. בתחושה שלי היום, אנחנו מרכיבים את המין האנושי כולו כתאים למשהו גדול יותר. וכשאתה בונה משהו גדול יותר, ושנבנה משהו גדול יותר, נושא הפרטיות הוא נושא מאוד מאוד מעניין. כי אתה יודע מי הם התאים הכי פרטיים, עם הכי הרבה פרטיות בגוף האדם. התאים הסרטניים. World order seems too fragile to entrust to the vision of the cypherpunks and crypto-anarchists, especially those unwilling to show their faces. No. I was ready to end my piece there, but then Smuggler came back out of the shadows. In a private IRC chat, he took a fairly big leap for a privacy extremist. 
and told me I should come for a visit. Riding around the streets of Berlin with two guys in masks made me a little uncomfortable, even if we'd already met once before. What must have been going through the taxi driver's head? Think about it, like, psychologically, why you were nervous. And... I mean, look at you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, but fear can be a misleading emotion. What was I supposed to be afraid of, really? The cancerous cells? Or giving up our privacy and individuality? to become one big organism. You can make all people work the same ways. And we see that in, in nature as well, farming for example. You know, if you're using all the same methods, all the same crop, all the, all the time, sooner or later, your farming operation will break down because reality depends on diversity to become stable. Cut off camera here. Yeah. Privacy is to ideas what evolution is to biology. You know, to have a healthy ecosystem, you need local niches and you need evolution, you need different organisms who are like mutating, who are evolving, and some of them will die and some of them will prosper. And then the whole is a very resilient structure. And the same for a healthy society. You need many different ideas and the good ones will actually survive. And if you, if you think about this future of, of all humanity being one organism, going one direction, one bug kills the whole thing. Right. And it's game over. And that is actually, that would be worse than our fears of nuclear war have ever been. I mean, imagine what we had with the Third Reich in Germany. Imagine that just the global. Third Reich globally. No other countries stopping it. What the fuck, you know? For all our forward progress, all the benefits of our interconnected world, is history truly just bound to repeat itself? We're entering a future that our parents couldn't imagine. Um, what will be the result of that is, is up to science fiction. Now, I don't want to live in a future where the control over everything, every bit of technology, every bit of information, how to build things, what to think, is, is so big that, you know, George Orwell uh, is rotating in his grave, you know, um, because I don't think that such a future will be very sustainable. So then when is your work done? Never. Yeah, never. <laughs> I mean, some people work for surveillance and we work to increase privacy. We will never get there. It's an ideal, an ideal to strive for. Plus, even if we work for more privacy, it doesn't mean that anybody will stop working for surveillance. So as long as they're working for surveillance, we have a job to do. But some people would say, I don't know, maybe you're paranoid. I mean, you're not outright criminals, you don't sell drugs, you don't, I don't know. But I mean, there are many. I think the whole discussion, it's weird how the discussion got so reframed that we are actually the ones who have to do the defending. You know, why do you have curtains in your flat? Why do you lock your door? And there are many old historical incidents where people got killed because of data collected of them. Yeah. You know, that's what happened in the Third Reich. The thing that happened in the years before the Third Reich even existed is that a lot of nation states required registration of citizens. And one of the things that many states like the Netherlands, Belgium, France, Germany required was to write down your religion. The Nazis came in and took those registries to search them. Right. So when Germany invaded other countries, they would just have just to go look there, up the register, look through the kill registers, them, kill them. and right. kill the people with the wrong religion. Right. You know, they didn't know that might be a problem in ten years. Most of them was. never believed it. 
one should realize that you cannot actually know what the future brings. You, you cannot even make up the shit that's happening on the world today, let alone in five years. Leaving the container, I turned my phone back on and found my way to the train via Google Maps. I pulled up Gmail to send off the article to my editor and wondered how I could sum it all up. Where did the rabbit hole lead me to? The Darknet wasn't the great evil I'd been led to believe. If anything, it seemed it might be the only place left for us to escape the increasingly watchful eyes of Big Brother. A place where we could shed our old identities and begin to create new ones. Even new worlds. A place where we could know real freedom. Only here I kept returning to smugglers' words as I left the container. That most people don't want real freedom at all. They just want enough freedom to be comfortable.